It's an amazing thing to be able to sing that Jesus loves me, isn't it? And of course, we know he has put that beyond doubt or beyond question when he went to the cross and at Calvary died for sinners like us. Amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Yes, Jesus loves me. Something well worth rejoicing in. Well, turn with me in your Bible to John chapter 17 today, and uh, I want to do a brief reading at the beginning of this chapter with you this morning. While you're turning up the place, I want to thank our brother very much for his welcome and uh, assure you that it's a pleasure for me to be along in Kilkeel again today and to have the opportunity of opening the Word of the Lord for you in the service again this morning. It's always a pleasure to come to this part of the world for many reasons. It's a delightful place to live. I was away round by the harbor and looking round me there this morning, and the scenery is exceptional. And uh, being the son of a fisherman from Port of Ugi, that's where my dad came from, and I was born and brought up in the, ax the outskirts of that town, it's always good to go back to what you would call something like your roots. So I'm glad to be here today, and I'm also glad to see that the Lord is blessing the ministry of Brother George very, very much indeed amongst you. And we'll be praying that in the days to come, that blessing will continue upon him and his wife and family and upon the fellowship here at Kilkeel. I would ask your uh, permission just now to mention the fact that I hope to begin a gospel campaign tonight in the town of Guildford. Now, if you know where Guildford is, it lies between Portadown and Banbridge. You get Lurgan here, Portadown here, Banbridge here, Guildford somewhere in the middle of the three. And uh, I value your prayers very much for that mission indeed. I was sharing with our brother who led the service this morning the fact that I was there for a gospel mission about seven months ago, and it turned in to be a very unusual affair in that the Lord started to work in the lives of Christians, in the lives of his own people, and things happened which time wouldn't allow me to go into today. But because of that, the folks in charge of the work felt that we need to go back for another effort as soon as ever we possibly could. So, God willing, that effort begins tonight. And strange as it may seem, Judith, who was announced for next Sunday, is the opening singer at the gospel mission tonight. She opens and closes every gospel mission I have. Every, on the Sunday evening, she always does the first and the last, and that has been going for years. So pray much for God's blessing to rest upon that mission, and I certainly would appreciate you lifting us constantly before God in prayer for that matter. Now, John 17, please, and let's begin at verse 1. These words speak Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. Now, if I could say something before I read any further. John 17 is an amazing chapter which deals with our Lord Jesus Christ in prayer. The basic lesson of the chapter is this. It is a blueprint of the ministry that the Savior carries on just now at the Father's right hand in glory. We are assured there is one God and one mediator between God and men, 
It is the man, Christ Jesus. And if you desire to know what he does and how he does it, John 17 will answer many, if not all, of your questions. So, I thought I'd just point that out to you now in passing. It is an intercessory prayer. Now, verse 2. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And if you look for a definition of eternal life, here's what it is. And this is life eternal, or eternal life if you like, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Now, that's what eternal life is. It's to know God in Christ, and it's to know Christ in God. That's an amazing thing. That's why it's eternal. That's why I believe without a doubt in eternal security that you're saved for eternity. And that verse there, I think, proves it beyond a shadow of a doubt. Now, in verse 4, he says, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Now, we'll simply end it there as our reading this morning. May God add his own blessing to the reading of his inspired and infallible word. In this particular chapter, from which we have read together this morning, friends, we find our Lord Jesus Christ saying and doing some remarkable and some amazing things. For example, as the Savior begins to pray, we are told that he lifted up his eyes to heaven. And with the eyes heavenward, the Savior began to talk to his Father. Now, of course, when we engage in prayer, we usually bow our head and close our eyes, but the Savior didn't. He did the very opposite. I remember driving with a guy in a car one day, and he was a little bit wild behind the wheel. And I remember well saying to him, I said, hey boy, why are you in such a hurry to get to this town? He was giving me a lift. And he looked at me and he said this, I'm in a hurry to get there before the 24-hour garage closes. Now figure that one out, but leave it to the end of the meeting. But I said to him, this is wild. Ah, he said, don't worry. He said, I pray as I'm driving. Well, I thought, I hope he doesn't shut his eyes to pray. Whenever he's driving, I hope he watches and I hope he prays. Well, that's what the Savior is doing here. But in this particular opening verse of the chapter, friends, when the Lord Jesus said some very remarkable things, there is one statement that he made in the verse that is more than remarkable, I think. And I want to talk to you folks about it for a time in your meeting today. He said this, five words, Father, the hour is come. Father, the hour is come. You might very well say to me today, that's a very unusual thing for Jesus to do. Were not all the hours of his life valuable and very important? Of course they were. Was he not constantly and continually under the scrutiny of heaven as they observed him going about doing good? healing all that were oppressed of the devil 
for God was with him. Of course, that's the case. And when he emerged from the waters at Jordan, where he was baptized by John in identification with the nation to which he belonged, the heavens were opened unto him. And God the Father was heard to say, This is my beloved Son, in whom is all my delight. So, continually, the eyes of heaven were upon him. But here on this occasion, he picks out one hour. And he seems to elevate and uplift it more than all the others of his life. And he says, I repeat again to the Father, the hour is come. The question is, what did he mean? Well, first of all, let me say this to you this morning, friends, that this hour beyond a shadow of a doubt was the hour of eternal appointment. An hour that was mapped out marked out, decided for him, way yonder in the council chambers of eternity. Were I to deal with nothing else from the pulpit this morning but that particular thing, I tell you, it would amaze you to see what is meant by the councils of eternity. You see, my friends, there was a time when there was no world as we know it today. There was a time when there was no sun as we knew it today. There was a time when there was no moon or stars as we know them also today. I went out in a clear night and looked up just the other evening, and I'm thinking to myself, I wonder what this all looked like before Genesis 1 and 1 came into being. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And of course, you might ask, why is the earth singled out? Well, the reason for that being, friends, I believe that it was on the earth that God intended to carry out his redemptive purposes. However, there was a time when none of this creation existed. But there was never a time when there was no triune God. You can never go back way into the untrodden paths of eternity before the womb of creation burst forth and the sun, the moon, and the stars, and the world appeared. You will never reach a point where the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit did not exist. Now, being a creature of a day and a creature of time, I find the word eternity very difficult to understand. The hymn writer said, it was a measureless, limitless, boundless decree. It was incomprehensible, its vastness extensible, it's ever and ever and ever to be. And he added, halt on the brink today, ponder eternity, ever and ever and ever to be. I cannot fathom by my mind today the vastness of that word, eternity. You see, in order for you and I to understand things, we talk about past, present, and future. But in eternity, friend, there's no such thing. It's all N-O-W, now. Everything's happening now as one unit. And away in the councils of eternity, and I'm using the word past so that we can understand it, it was determined that Jesus would arrive at that hour. And as he prays, he said, 
the hour is come. Can that be proved from elsewhere? Well, when you go to the preaching of the Apostle Peter, Peter was a remarkable character. I'm glad to hear that you're studying the letters of Peter. I feel sometimes that Peter's letters get a little bit neglected, maybe because of where they're positioned within our Bible, because preachers, myself included, tend to work so much with the writings of Paul that the other letters at the end don't seem to get the important position that they ought to have. But Peter was a remarkable guy, the great apostle to the Jewish world, Paul being the apostle to the Gentile world. But you remember when you go to the early chapters of the Acts, Peter stands up on the day of Pentecost, and he looks those who were guilty of crucifying Christ straight in the eye. And as a man inspired by the Spirit of God resting upon him, he said, you took him, and by wicked hands you crucified him and you slew him. Of course, we know this, friends, that at Calvary men commit, committed a crime that they could not commit today. I have heard People say that the Lord Jesus Christ was brutally murdered. Well, there's a sense in which that is correct, but there's a sense in which it isn't. Now, let me try to explain. You see, there's such a thing as suicide. I was sharing with our friends, some of our friends at the door this morning, that I was listening to a, a news bulletin, and these lands, uh, they were telling us that already this year, I think it is, 248 people have committed suicide. And I think that's tragic because the most of them are young people. But I won't deal with that in the meeting today. And then there's, yes, suicide is when a person lifts up their hand against themselves. And then there's murder when a person lifts up their hand against their fellow man and takes deliberately their life. That is murder. Is that not what happened to the Lord Jesus? My friend, there's a step higher than that. And that's a crime called deicide. Whenever the creature lifts up his hand against the Creator, that's what happened at Calvary. It could only happen again if Jesus were here, and he won't be. So it will never happen again. That crime was committed once and once only, and Peter knew it, and those who heard him knew what he was saying. You took him, and by wicked hands, you crucified him and you slew him. And when they heard it, they were cut to their heart, and they cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? And of course, the way of salvation was explained, and many of them were saved. Now, you say to me, why are you bringing us there? Well, for this simple reason, friend. Before Peter accused them, and rightly so of what they did, he made this remarkable statement, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God you took on by wicked hands have crucified and slain. So Peter's away back where I'm talking about this morning where this R was decided, where this R was brought into existence, where this R came about, away in the councils of eternity where no human eye has ever seen or no human ear has ever heard, no human hand has ever touched, no human foot has ever stood only the Trinity understand. And away there, that R was decided. Of course, you and I who know the Savior were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. That brings us away back there too. But you know, whenever the Apostle John was writing, now, 
I'm way onto something here this morning, friends. I never intended to go near, but you'll, you'll, you'll allow me to do that. You'll have to allow me anyway, for I'm going to do it anyway. I had no intention of talking about this, but that's how my mind seems to be going. And my friends, whenever John, in the Revelation, that mighty, mighty book, is looking backward again, talking about our Lord Jesus Christ, he talks about him as being the lamb slain. Now, very often, and I don't want to sound critical this morning, friends, because I don't like to criticize, and I'm not normally given to it, but I've heard that verse quoted wrongly. When people will quote it, the lamb slain from before the foundation of the world. That word before is not in your Bible. He's the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Now, you say to me, you're splitting hairs. No, friend, I'm not. Let me explain to you what that means. What John is saying is this. Go to that moment which certainly did exist when God laid the foundations of the earth. Now, that's the unknown past. I don't know when that was. But you remember, he said to Job, Job, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? And Job was silenced by the statement. He hadn't a word to say. But what John is saying there is this. He said, you go to that moment when the foundations of the earth were laid and make that your starting point. Now, don't go forward, but go back from it. The lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Go right back, and you will never come to a place where the Lord Jesus was not the lamb slain. He always was. Now, again, the finite mind cannot take that in. You need to be God to understand that, and we're not. Like can only be discerned by like, therefore God can only understand God. But what I'm telling you today is fact, absolute fact. The foundation of the world is the starting point for John. And a way back, Christ was always the lamb slain. Oh, that we could get a vision of our Lord Jesus Christ in those matters to show us just how unique he was, is, and shall forever be. But the hour is come. Now, can you see the, the importance of that statement, my friend, and what it really means? It's an hour of eternal appointment. Now, let me go on to say this to you, and this may be as far as I'll get this morning in the meeting, but that's fine. It was also the hour of extreme suffering, the sufferings of Christ. Some time ago, I had the privilege of visiting what we call the Holy Land, <clears throat> and I was taken into Pilate's judgment hall to the Garden of Gethsemane, and to all of those places as part of this tour. And I think I could honestly say that my understanding of the sufferings of Christ increased immensely by that visit. It really did. And while I don't like to divide up the sufferings of the Lord Jesus Christ to understand what he endured, there are times when that is necessary. And sometimes when we talk about the sufferings of Christ, we leave out the mental side. But as I stood in that judgment hall, and my mind went away back to those words, crucify him, crucify him, will not have this man to reign over us. Who is this man? King of kings and Lord of lords, the creator of the universe, God's only begotten and well-beloved Son, and they're screaming out in hatred. We do not have this man to reign over us. Now, while I believe in the deity of Christ, I also believe totally in the humanity of Christ. He was a real man, 
tempted in all points like us, we are yet without sin. Have you ever thought what that did to his mind as he stood there? We will not have this man to reign over us. I tell you, the mental agony that he endured at that particular moment was beyond human description. Also Gethsemane, as he contemplated the cross, and his mind went forward to that spot where he would suffer and bleed and die as the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And he was heard to say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Father, if it be possible, rather, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will but thine be done. And his sweat became, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. I'm not a medical man by any manner of means, but Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, who was one of the top medical men, has this to say, that that statement became as it were, was a statement of actuality. The mental agony of that moment was so great that Jesus actually sweat blood, literally falling down to the ground. What a moment. Try to enter in to the mind of Christ. No wonder the Scripture says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Satan is out today to destroy the minds of people, particularly of our young people. No matter where you go today, there's this boom, boom of music, horrible stuff coming out, so much so that you become so accustomed to it, you hardly notice it anymore. But it's all a satanic trick. Oh, how we need to train our minds just to be like his. Can you see that mental agony? And what about the physical agony of Christ at that hour? That hour that he talked about. What about the scourge? I remember standing at what they tell us was the spot where prisoners were flogged. And, and I saw this large trough-like thing. Now, I speak with reverence this morning, but the nearest thing that I could use to describe it to you was like a feeding trough you farmers would use. Remember those big stone ones they used to be? And they filled it up with water and what have you for animals to feed out. Now, I'm speaking with respect. That's just a description of what this looked like. And I remember saying to the guy, I said, what was that for? And he told me, he said, you know, while one soldier used the scourge, that three-strand scourge upon the physical body of the Lord Jesus, another one was waiting. And every time the scourge withdrew, they lifted a bucket of salt and water out of that whatever, and they threw it into his back. Now, can you imagine what that was like? The purpose of all this, my friends, was to kill the victim without having to crucify him. You say, why is that? Well, some of those men weren't easy crucifying. They wouldn't walk to the place of execution calmly and let the boys get on with it. No, they would be kicking and smashing the whole way there, thumping their accusers and their executioners with all the might and power that they could muster trying to escape. And it wasn't an easy thing to do, to crucify a man, especially some of those criminals. That's what touched the centurion when he saw the Lord Jesus led as a lamb to the slaughter and the sheep before our shearers is dumb. You ever notice this bit? So he openeth not his mouth. 
But the old centurion, as he's looking on, oh boy, he can't believe what he's seeing and what he's not hearing. And he said about the Lord Jesus, truly, this was a righteous man. I believe that centurion's in heaven today. I really do. I really believe that man was saved because of what he saw at Calvary. But that's only the scourge, my friend. Then there's the crown of thorns. I walked into a church in the outskirts of Port Adan one day recently to take part in the funeral of a man that I'd had the joy of leading to Christ many, many years ago. As I was going in through the door, friends, the back door of the church, I came on something that I'd never seen in my life before. There was this scourge sitting, and there was a crown of thorns and a number of things that we're familiar with concerning the cross. And I said to the caretaker, I said, tell me, where did you get the?" He says, look, one of our folk was over in that part of the world, and they brought these home with them. What they believed was a copy of the actual things that happened to Christ. And as I looked at them, I realized, yes, this is exactly what it was like. And I remember taking into my hand, my friends, a bunch of those thorns that was used to make the crown of thorns. And the very shortest one was longer than my middle finger. It was more like a row of six-inch nails. And the word plaited means they were tactfully plaited, round in a, in a bunch, and they were placed around the Savior's brow. And then they smote him on the head with a reed. Now, again, I speak reverently. I always thought of the reed like a rush that grows in the field, but no, the nearest thing we have to it is a brush shaft. And I'm speaking with reverence now. And that was used as a hammer to dra drive that crown of thorns into the forehead and the temples and the back of the head of the Lord Jesus. And you can imagine the blood flowing everywhere. And there was the buffeting. Again, if a man survived the scourge, the point of the buffeting was to kill him if they could. Hands were tied behind his back. The centurion brought in 100 men. Centurion is the word for century. 50 up every side. The Lord Jesus Christ was stood before the first man who clenched his fist, drove it into the face of the Savior with all the might that he could muster, and drove him over to the other fella, and that went on right down the line until the Lord Jesus Christ was smashed in the face by the fist of 100 men who really knew how to torment a man. What a scene. The end of it all, had Mary not known who he was, she wouldn't have recognized him. When they had done their worst in the judgment hall, they coughed the very liquor-smelling phlegm out of their throat, and they spat it into his face. They put an old soldier's cloak on him, and they put that reed into his hand, and they set him down on a stool of some sort. They mock-worshipped him. Thank God there's a day coming when every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He was taken to the place called Calvary. I remember walking that road. You'll pardon these personal thoughts today. But I was thinking about that cross, that beam. Now, I don't know what weight a cross must be. I've heard all sorts, and I'd never accept those things. Speculation's foolish. Probably no two of them were the same. But... For a cross to carry the weight of a man's body, it had to be pretty big and pretty heavy. And that was laid upon that scourge, brutally, brutally marred back of Christ. Any wonder he stumbled? And they took him to the top of the hill where I must stop this morning. That cross was thrown down on the ground. 
Brethren and sisters, men and women, today I speak carefully at this minute. But I have seen many, many artists' impressions of the cross. And for obvious reasons, on every single impression and picture, there was a loincloth on the victim. You hear what I'm saying? There was no loincloth at Calvary. He endured the cross, and he despised the shame for the glory that was set before him. Then they nailed him by the hands and feet to the tree. While a soldier put his knee here and another there, the nail was driven something through the wrist, I don't know, some through the hand. It was driven through. Repeat it on the other side. And his feet crossed in an axe shape, and they drove one nail, which I believe was a tent peg. An ordinary nail would never have done the job. I think it was a tent peg that was used. They drove that through his feet. They lifted that cross up and dropped it down into the socket with a thud. Every major joint of his body was knocked out of joint. He was left hanging there, the blistering heat of a noonday sun. That's what men did to Christ. They hated him without a cause. One could go on to talk about the sacrificial and substitutional sufferings. Time don't allow me to do that. And even the eternal suffering when he stepped into the eternity of a lost soul. Whatever curse was mine he bore, the wormwood and the gall, there in that lone, mysterious hour, my cup, he drained it all. I must stop. The hour is come. I have to leave it there. Maybe some other time we'll get a chance to finish what's before my mind today. Concerning that are so much involved. But I thank you for your attention. And I trust that the Lord will impress upon you and upon my mind today what he endured to save our souls from death and from hell. The Lord bless you.